good morning, everybody. Uh, uh, we have one hour, 15 minutes for the uh, discussion uh, about the artificial intelligence and uh, uh, how to uh, adjust uh, legislation and uh, uh, find the best solutions uh, for artificial intelligence development uh, uh, with focus on uh, healthcare area. Um, uh, we will start with our host, Axel Voss, uh, member of the European Parliament, also member of the AIDA committee, which is important because uh, uh, this committee uh, uh, is discussing all issues related to artificial intelligence and also prepared the roadmap how to achieve some goals. So, uh, 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 Axel, please, uh, the screen is yours. Thanks a lot and a warm welcome to you all and especially also to Michael. Thanks for the introduction. And um, so we, what we have to have in mind is that the whole health sector is a kind of a billion euro market and is uh, totally under heavy pressure regarding the competition. And uh, especially also EU would like to take up this um, challenge and um, and so we are in the sandwich position between China and the US so that we have to have in mind um, not only competition also speed is key for succeeding and um, so what can AI do in the health sector so from and, and this is a little bit a part of this AI report in the AIDA committee so we can unlock solutions in the health sector that could save millions of life, improving our standards of living and bring competition, um, the competition edge to the European ICT sector. So we are um, already, and, and this has already been used, uh, we can detect diseases and uh, abnormalities at an early stage and more accurately through a real-time pattern recognition and image processing, thus speeding up diagnosis and treatment and reducing also unnecessary biopsies. So it has a potential to tailor treatments and drug developments to specific patient needs. It's um, relieving uh, healthcare systems and especially medical staff by supporting routine tasks such as patient transport and reminding patients on their medication and to remedy challenges posed by rapidly aging populations. So what are our current problems now? Also having still in mind competition and speed is key. Um, the AI in the health sector is particularly dependent on large amounts of personal data and the data sharing, data accessibility, data interoperability to realize the full potential of AI and health, which are currently lacking. And additional legal steps are, and, and uh, legal steps, time and, and uh, purpose limitation introduced by the GDPR and, and differing interpretations across the member states have led now to legal uncertainty and a lack of cooperation in the health sector in the European Union. So the specific uh, consent obligations hinder the processing of used medical data for further analysis and studies and this leads to the lengthy delays to scientific discoveries and a significant bureaucratic burden in health research. So what might um, our political uh, or policy recommendations and hopefully you are adding today also a lot of these recommendations to this list. So of course we are calling also on the, the commission to set up a global tone on cutting edge uh, health healthcare and, and well-being plays the benefits of AI at the center of policy making. So there is a need of prioritization of funding and setting of strategic goals. 
we need this clear liability framework and harmonized approval regimes for AI's uh, medical applications and, and, and medicine development or tested via AI and machine learning. We also call in, the, in our report for sector specific legislation for health data in order to seize also the full potential of AI and um, measures, we are asking also for measures and incentives that enhance the healthcare provider's potential to scale up the uptake of AI solutions and share them with others. And uh, we are asking also to support the setup and operation of a European health data space in order to foster the sharing of health data. And uh, also what we should have still in mind is that our citizens and uh, our talents and our skills should also include it so that the education of healthcare professionals as well as, as skills in applying data protection legislation and dealing with sensitive data including the promotion of data anonymization. So these are in, in very short version, the outcome of the report in the health data sector and the health sector itself. Of course, we need also a lot of these preconditions like a European solution, like political, strong political will and common goal and so, the meaning at least we should join forces in the European Union. And I hope at first you might underline these one or two or all aspects of uh, this um, report. And secondly, also, if you add something to these uh, policy recommendations, we would be very happy to take this on board. Thanks a lot and thanks for participate here also in our discussion. Thank you very much, Axel. I think it is uh, very important what you have said, uh, because uh, uh, it uh, shows how important it is uh, considering uh, all aspects of using the data. Uh, you have mentioned uh, data sharing models, you have mentioned uh, the need of accessibility of data, and you have mentioned interoperability of data. All those should be discussed when uh, uh, we are uh, working uh, not only on artificial intelligence, but on the other hand, uh, when we are working on the future European health data space, because I think it will be very, very useful uh, to combine those uh, two efforts. And as you have mentioned, to join uh, all forces and to join all par partners to achieve the goal because uh, uh, we need uh, uh, the competitive advantages and on the other hand we need the speed. Uh, uh, the, de the debate on artificial intelligence is growing up. Uh, uh, two weeks ago um, uh, the UNESCO presented uh, its recommendations about artificial intelligence and one week ago the Council of Europe and the committee focused on artificial intelligence development presented uh, the proposal on artificial intelligence convention. So I think that European contribution, European Union contribution is very, very important and we have the possibility to create uh, uh, norms and to, to set the norms, which will be in the future, I hope, uh, global. Thanks a lot. And now uh, uh, we have the excellent panel. Uh, uh, we have in this, uh, in this panel, uh, uh, Verena Kaip, uh, Associate Consultant Health Practice from APCO Worldwide. Uh, we have Professor Regina Beatstone, uh, Chair of the Department of Radiology in the Netherlands Cancer Institute in Amsterdam. Uh, we have uh, Professor Piotr Szymański, Chair of the Clinical Cardiology Center in Warsaw, and also Chair of the Regulatory Affairs Committee uh, in, uh, the, in the European Society of Cardiology. We have Bleden Rees, Chair of the Digital Health Society, and we have uh, uh, Vida Groznik, CEO and co-founder of NEOS, and assistant professor of, uh, at the University of uh, Primorska.
and we have Dr. Jose Fernandez. So this is a, a package, fantastic package of our of our uh, fantastic group of our of our panelists and. Uh, uh, I think that we need to start and uh, uh, please, uh, uh, Verena Cape, uh, uh, the turn is yours, please. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today uh, and to discuss with you uh, how artificial intelligence can augment healthcare and how it can help. Um, I have to ask the SME um, office because my um, PowerPoint presentation seems to um, crash, uh, be crashed right now. Yeah. Uh, maybe you can share my slides. Um, that yeah. would be amazing. Perfect. Maybe we can start with the next slide. So AI has created a tremendous hype and this trend evolved because uh, AI is becoming an increasing part of our daily lives and we're surrounded by AI. Um, using Google search, a Netflix, Siri, um, today's environment is um, something where AI is not um, a fiction, an idea or the future, it's already there. And I would go as far to say it's a requirement and it offers many opportunities. Next slide, please. Um, so artificial intelligence is here to stay. Um, some believe that AI may, um, so the future of AI is, can either be exciting or worrisome, depending on who you talk to. Some believe that AI will take over humanity, while others think that AI is far from achieving anything that is um, close to human intelligence. But I believe that AI, in fact, is human and it is little artificial because it's inspired, created and impacted by people. It's agnostic and what we make out of it. Next slide, please. So when we talk about AI, we talk about big data and we have ever increasing healthcare data from EHR systems, from personal fitness trackers, connected medical devices, implants or other sensors that connect, uh, collect real time information. So we have reports um, which state um, that a few years ago, um, the information was doubling uh, every three years. But now, um, since 2020, it was estimated that information is doubling every 73 days. So we see an exponential growth of health data, which can be overwhelming on one side. But on the other hand, it allows us to see um, patterns of specific diseases. And um, it has the potential to um, transform healthcare in the coming years. However, more work is required to understand both uh, the opportunities and the potential pitfalls in using big data and artificial intelligence in uh, health decision making. However, I also think that COVID uh, has made us more open to embracing new technologies, but we should also keep in mind that it's also the strategy, yet not alone the technology itself that drives digital transformation. And we're currently in a paradigm shift um, and we all need to deal with certain challenges on, and we have to do that on various levels, on the EU level regarding legislation, but also on organizational level. We need to buy into these new technologies. So also we need ambassadors, clinical champions on all levels who are not just passively open to this new environment, but actively promote it. Next slide, please. So where are the opportunities of AI? I mean, it's a truly transforming technology, uh, technology and it can play a vital role to support health systems from disease prevention um, to the care delivery and patient empowerment. It offers the tremendous opportunity to humanize healthcare by freeing up time for the cl uh, clinicians to interact with their patients. And we are all patients at a certain time in our lives and patients want a human touch in medicine. So it has a great opportunity and it can help us on many levels, on individual level by the priorization of examinations, clinical decision-making or fighting clinical errors at department level by streamlining workflows in departments, reducing patient waiting times or predictions of no-shows. And also at organizational level, it can provide us actionable insights and untangle the complexity, which means better management of patient volumes. And also on health system level, it can connect entire health data ecosystems and enable meaningful interaction and relationships. But they're also challenging. It's challenging to moving new technologies forward. Next slide, please. 
There also has to be alignment in vision, commitment in exploration, and mutual excitement. There are not only opportunities, but there are also challenges which, uh, when it comes to the implementation of AI. Uh, as uh, MEP uh, Foss already mentioned, there are regulatory um, issues and uh, we have a complex field in healthcare, which is a heavily regulated sector. But Europe is seen as regulatory superpower and we have the GDPR and it's time to build our technological sovereignty. We need to ensure a strong common governance framework with the right balance of data protection, which also allows innovation at the same time. So with the proposed AI Act, we should also ensure that there are no inconsistencies with the GDPR and with other regulation, of course. So the framework should also support transparency also when it comes to the creation of algorithms to overcome concern in data bias but we also have um, challenges on an organizational level um, we have it legacy systems so hospitals have already ehr systems in place and also um, maybe small startups who um, deliver these ai solution face problems and challenges with interoperability um, and um, with um, that data um, serenity so uh, we need to also tackle um, here the fragmentation and incompatible data but also on individual level we face talent shortage for national and regional um, health systems it's difficult to attract talent also in it sector with the it workforce so we need training upskilling and reskilling which play an, an important role if we want to benefit and at an individual level we also have trust so we face issues of trust and, uh, and skepticism. So we need to have everyone involved and everyone wants to, uh, needs to be willing to push forward and to get into the driver's seat. So we need to focus also on digital literacy for citizens, for patients and for healthcare professionals. And we also face here challenges uh, for the professional world, of course, but we need to create a framework and an ecosystem where AI can support clinicians. It will not replace them because some critical voices always are fear that some will be replaced, but it should augment the daily work of doctors and healthcare professionals. So I, I will not replace doctors, rather doctors who leverage the power of AI may replace mid and long term those who do not. So we should responsibly embrace AI and not fear it. Um, next slide. Thank you very much um, for listening uh, to my intervention. It's a pleasure to be here and I'm looking forward um, to the other panelists. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Verena. I think it was very inspiring and a good uh, outline of our, our discussion. Uh, and I think we need to remember about what you have said about how to humanize humanize uh, uh, healthcare. It's very important because there are new challenges and possibilities uh, uh, to build the new relationship between patients and doctors and uh, clinicians. And also uh, uh, data, are, uh, uh, this is a key problem. 35% of, uh, of uh, uh, stored data all over the world are health data. Yes? So it means the importance and significance uh, of uh, health, uh, health data. And uh, we need to, to be careful to use. But on the other hand, we need to use uh, under some conditions, the data. Thank you very much. And now the turn, uh, and I want to, to move to uh, Professor Regina Bits Tan, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to share my screen now. Okay. Uh, I think you can see it, right? All right, thank you very much for your invitation. Uh, so I'm a radiologist, Regina Bitstan. I'm chairing the Department of Radiology in the Comprehensive Cancer Center in the Netherlands uh, in Amsterdam. I'm also the president of the European Society of Radiology and a member of the uh, EU Mission Board for Cancer. Uh, from these perspectives, I would like to share with you, and it's only complementary and conf confirming the message of Verena, uh, what, is the, what are the opportunities for SMEs 
uh, uh, with respect to the uh, radiological and imaging part. So in uh, May, I could already uh, share my experiences of AI in healthcare, especially in radiology, uh, at the Special Committee on Beating Cancer public hearing. Um, I think it's important that uh, you understand that uh, we are already like um, using digital data for 20 years. Uh, so we have a, a huge volume and that's why we also are already implementing AI in the radiological practice, although it's not as fast as we would like to see because we are already like including this discussion since maybe five years in our specialty. This is an example of a patient in my institute and this uh, chest x-ray was read by AI. There was no intervention of the radiologist. So the report were also, I'm, uh, I ap apologize for the Dutch report, but the report was precise and correct. And it was also generated by the AI. What does it mean that AI is able to look at patterns? We know that because there are already many studies that shows that AI can really help us in routine tasks where radiologists' eye can be exhausted. You know that with breast cancer screening, radiologists are needed uh, with double reading. So we need two radiologists to look at hundreds of images in one day of screening. And it is a repetitive task of pattern recognition. Now, this is a study that shows uh, interesting results. Uh, the, the higher or the larger the uh, area under this curve, the better the performance. You can see here the curve of AI, which is outperforming the curves of expert breast radiologists, and they, these are better than general radiologists. When we add AI, to the reading of radiologists. So as an assistant, you can see that there is hardly any difference. AI is still performing very well, but there's hardly any difference between the expertise of the radiologist. So that really is an important message because it has impact on the health costs, the training of expertise, the availability of radiologists in Europe. So my conclusion, which was already shared with uh, by Verena, is that AI recognizes patterns and continuously learns to get better. The radiologist's value is definitely not defined anymore by pattern recognition, and AI may become better than us, but by clinical relevance. So AI will not replace radiologists, but upgrade the, radio the role of the radiologist. So in my department, we are implementing AI in clinical practice. We have in cancer imaging an increasing workload uh, because imaging is a center in the uh, treatment management of patients with cancer. So what we do is we ask AI software to uh, select and prioritize the findings on the CT that uh, are critical to be evaluated uh, by radiologists or uh, uh, when they are very complex. So AI has uh, reduced significantly our radiologist reading times, but also we are safe that we know that everything is being picked up, which is critical for patient management. Uh, furthermore, I think that uh, when AI assists us in radiological wor uh, workflow, that it will keep the workload manageable, especially important in member states with limited radiologists. Now, having said this, uh, I'm looking from the perspective of cancer, but of course it applies to the entire uh, medical field. Uh, we know, and it has already been uh, addressed by the uh, MEP uh, Axel uh, Foss, um, that EU is investing in cancer uh, in billions in the EU for health program that uh, will uh, facilitate the program in the Europe beating cancer plan, the EU cancer mission and the EU health data space. Why cancer? Because cancer is a very um, uh, a big problem in Europe. Europe has one quarter of all cancer 
cases worldwide while having less than 10 percent of world's population and the number of new cancer cases diagnosed is protected is projected to increase by more than 25 percent in europe by uh, 2035 and europe definitely needs a better and equitable uh, access to prevention diagnosis and treatment and need better survival rates and quality of life so this is how cancer field is moving in the coming uh, years. We will have more screening and therefore a stage migration from advanced cancer to more early stage tumors. Hence, we will see smaller tumors and we don't need always to aggressively treat these tumors, but will have a minimal invasive technology in surgery and radiology to uh, treat this cancer patients, a cure with better quality of life. We will have efficient, but a very expensive targeted and immunotherapy. So we need to select those patients uh, using uh, AI, uh, combining all information to predict which patients will benefit from these treatments. So the cancer mission has recommended 13 recommendations uh, uh, how to invest in cancer. Uh, these 13 recommendations are in the areas of understanding cancer, so fundamental uh, research uh, in prevention, uh, in optimizing diagnostic and treatment, and in, in intervention in quality of life and all to ensure equitable access. Uh, I just want to point at a, a few recommendations because I think that is an important opportunity for the SMEs and us healthcare professionals, especially I'm speaking as a radiologist, to work together. So uh, optimizing existing screening programs and develop new approaches for screening and early di uh, detection developing an EU-wide research program on early diagnostic and minimally invasive treatment technologies. Those are two of the 13 recommendations for bold actions by the uh, Mission on Cancer. Now, if we are using AI, I think the power of AI is that we, it can combine all uh, data. So combining, uh, if we look from the diagnostic part, the uh, biomarkers of imaging, tissue, genomics, fluid, blood, and clinics. And as you can see, this combination can feed uh, the buildup of accurate uh, prediction models of outcome, the building by AI. And we have stressed that several disciplines is required and we should have a multi-stakeholder approach involving pharma and technology industry. And there is where the, uh, the team up together with SMEs are very important. So that is why I'm chairing the e uh, European Society of Radiology. I have uh, as a team in the next Congress, the Building Bridges, where we will uh, connect with industry partners. And even in this Congress, I will have a quite new concept where the industry will come into the program, uh, into the scientific uh, center and into the scientific program. So a very active role of the industry in the Congress. Now, if we're going to use AI, we need data. And creating a European Cancer Patient Digital Center uh, where cancer patients and survivors can deposit and share their data is one of the, I think, crucial recommendation of the EU mission. Uh, what we uh, would like to promote is that these virtual network of data infrastructures, that the patients are fully involved, that they will have full control over own data so we can give them a help passport, because in the end, it's all about the patient, that will give them a help passport that summarize the treatment, their outcome, their uh, uh, advice on follow-up and lifestyle. Um, what uh, is uh, interesting is that this recommendation is also aligned with a flagship eight initiative of the EU beating cancer plan where a sort of cancer survivor smart card is proposed, which is in fact the same as health passport. So for me, the creating a data center where patients will have full control of, of their own data and where data will not only be used 
uh, by researchers, but also for the use of patients is the next step that we need to take to help realize the full potential of real world evidence. And this is a step that can make the difference in outcome of cancer treatment. So a cancer focused approach, and that is why this team Patients in Focus is one of the big uh, programs in, the, uh, co in my Congress where I have asked the patient to be uh, involved and make a uh, specific program on that. So thank you very much for giving me this uh, uh, opportunity to um, share the message. Thank you very much, Professor Beat Stan, for the excellent presentation. This is a very good example of uh, how to humanize healthcare. Uh, and also this is a very good example what kind of advantages are to using artificial intelligence can bring to, to us to change the healthcare systems uh, uh, and also to avoid the situation in which clinicians, doctors uh, uh, can be full of threats and fears uh, against uh, artificial intelligence because, because you have uh, expressed very strongly that uh, this is the way uh, to, to upgrade uh, uh, the role of radiologists, uh, 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 not to replace the radiologists by artificial intelligence. I think it's uh, very, very uh, important. And also uh, this uh, way how to control the data by patients is, uh, I think, very important and can build the trust because uh, when we go forward and we want to change the healthcare paradigm, uh, we need to base it on, on the new model of trust. Thank you very much. And now uh, I want to, to give the floor, to give the screen. Uh, Professor Piotr Szymański, please, the screen is yours. Thank you very much for an opportunity to present my views. I'm, uh, let me share the screen. Um, I hope you can see it. Yes. I'm an imaging cardiologist by education, still practicing in interventional imaging, but I'm also chairing the Regulatory Affairs Committee of the European Society of Cardiology, so I'm involved in many aspects of regulations, including artificial intelligence. And therefore, I would like to present you a bit of a perspective of a practicing physician mixed with regulatory point of view. Let me see if I can efficiently change the slides. Now, from the clinical perspective, of course, interaction between the physician and the patient is diagnosis and then making prognosis to balance risks and benefits of therapy and then treatment based on evidence, of course. Now, in contrast to what happens in European legislation when health, where healthcare is not harmonized and European Union has got only supportive role in supporting healthcare systems, actually the knowledge and treatment least in cardiology, but in most areas is harmonized through clinical practice guidelines. And as you can see, for European, for the European Society of Cardiology, these are being uploaded in millions of copies and being applied by uh, not only European countries. So we've got a, a sort of harmonized data. And as far as treatment is concerned, we tend to provide the data and take to base our management on clinical trials, namely, uh, and that would be optimal randomized clinical trials. This is not cardiology. This is one of the recent trials on COVID treatment, but I'm just showing this as an example. Well, I'm showing this as an example because had we had this sort of randomized data and clinical trials, George Washington wouldn't die uh, out of streptococcal pharyngitis and being treated by bloodletting, which was totally inefficient in the first clinical trial. But bloodletting just occurred uh, 30 years after his death. But we have the same situation at the moment. So the interventions that are beneficial or likely beneficial in medicine, uh, they are, it's about one third of all interventions that we have. And there are numerous examples at the moment, also amantadine and ivrabadine, no, sorry, ivermectin used for, for COVID. AI can be used in clinical trials, and that's one of the examples of using AI to simplify them, shorten, enable better phenotyping of subgroups of patients that would benefit from technologies. So this is one proposal or one example of the use of the model. 
of AI. But as I mentioned, I'm the imaging cardiologist, so I'm using AI for diagnosis, and I'm using diagnostic medical devices such as echocardiography. But the problem with echocardiography is human beings, and of course the variability or inter-reason, inter-reader differences in making the diagnosis, which has been just touched uh, upon a moment before. And again, uh, machine learning can reduce this sort of variability, which is a good message. And it can also be used for image recognition and for different types of analysis, such as in this example. Nevertheless, we have a lot of problems, such as lack of unification of technologies. The, this is the same method of image recognition and analysis, but different vendors using a little bit different algorithms, which makes the technology not non-transferable from center to center and from one result to the other. And also, which is very important, when we think about using artificial intelligence in large databases, we have to have excellent data Whereas this study from Sweden a while ago indeed showed that the transducer defects, so the defects in, in the quality of images was recorded in nearly 40% of cases in 32 hospitals. So we've got problems with databases. Now with clinical reasoning and diagnostic imaging, you must be aware of the dead Salmon study. That was the IG Nobel Prize in Neuroscience in 2012 where the dead salmon was uh, underwent fMRI. And um, in order to fulfill the experiment, it was shown the photographs depicting human individuals in social situations. And he was asked questions on what emotions the individuals on the photo have, uh, he has been experiencing. And imaging demonstrated that dead salmon had some feelings, at least in terms of large data sets that were being analyzed. And in artificial intelligence, we have to deal with large data sets and uh, artifacts that we have. So we cannot replace humans, as you can see, uh, um, the directly encoded images unrecognizable to humans can be considered uh, uh, by DNNs as the familiar objects. So still there is a place for improvement. Uh, there's a place for humans there. Now, the principal problem that we have in terms of uh, medical devices is that there is limited evidence about their diagnostic accuracy and even more so diagnostic thinking efficacy and patient outcome efficacy. So we have very little data demonstrating that it influences reliably outcomes. Indeed, there are some tools that uh, advise us on, on the risk of surgeries or the, the success of surgeries but this, the evidence is still limited. And even more importantly so, they're not in their majority externally validated. This is the reason why uh, recently European Commission awarded a Horizon 2020 grant to a consortium led by the European Society of Cardiology to uh, provide standards on the clinical investigation of high-risk medical devices. The consortium is extensive, I'll not get into the details, but what is important to our discussion is that among the new methods of gen for generating clinical evidence, there is a package 2.3, developing guidelines for the evolution of artificial intelligence and standalone software. And I hope that we can discuss it further during our discussions. Thanks a lot, thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Piotr. Uh, uh, for your presentation. I think we need to, to understand that the, we are on the way, that this is not finished, yes, and uh, we are starting the uh, uh, work on regulation of artificial intelligence, but on the other hand, we need to work on uh, 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 efficiency models and evaluation uh, of uh, using uh, uh, of artificial intelligence in some clinical trials and in in some uh, uh, practical uh, therapy solutions, uh, diagnosis, and so on. So thank you very much, because uh, we need to go forward very quickly, very fastly, because speed is one of the important issue when we are looking at the competition all over the world related to the artificial intelligence. But on the other hand, we need to uh, uh, concentrate also on uh, 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 excellence yes, of our solutions. So uh, thanks a lot. Uh, 
uh, uh, many works are before us, so uh, uh, we need to continue our 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 presentation. Thank you, uh, Piotr. Thank you, Piotr. And now uh, I want to give the screen to Bladen Rees, uh, chair of the Digital Health Society. Please. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for the invitation to speak. So just to understand some of the comments <clears throat> that I am going to make, the Digital Health Society is a legacy of the Estonian presidency of uh, the European Union. So uh, our basic starting point is to want to see the maximum use of health data for the benefit of society. Indeed, we would say that health data is a societal good and that it is uh, critical that it is seen as a utility, if you like, which is a totally different approach to how it's traditionally seen. But the next point to, uh, to start with is really to say, what is health data? And that may sound uh, a strange question to ask, but what I mean is lots of people understand it to be EHR information. Uh, ordinary people will understand it to mean it's perhaps their GP records. Fewer people will understand it's their pharmacy records or their opticians records or their dentists records or indeed their social care records. And uh, we would add to that that it's also about data from other sectors. So whether information is relevant to whether if you have COPD or asthma or uh, and transport for the same reason around pollution. Uh, but a warning first now to the SMEs who are listening to this, and it's about the new emperor's clothes. So uh, sometimes I, I sit on the commercial board of Guy's and St. Thomas's Hospital in London, an academic health science centre, and I see lots of innovations. And sometimes you see lots of startups, SMEs coming with, uh, they talk about uh, AI, and you sort of think, is that really just an algorithm? Or is that really machine learning? Or is that AI? So for me, there's a lot of misunderstanding about these terms. It's used as though everybody has the same meaning and understands what it is. Um, and I then draw a distinction between the worried well and the seriously ill patients. Because when you're seriously ill, you will allow anyone access to your records. Um, I happen to know at one time, the person who was the 11th person in the world to have a colon transplant. And the first, I think seven or eight had died and he couldn't talk to them. So he blogged his entire medical record so that no one else had to go through what he was going through just to try and understand some simple questions. So the next question is, is healthcare data as super sensitive as we treat it? Partly because of the way GDPR uh, defines it. Um, and my point here is that lots of information about me might be sensitive to an employer. Um, it might be sensitive if I have a sexually transmitted disease. It might be sensitive if it's mental health, but there's an awful lot of other data that is not anything like as sensitive as that. And we tend to be treating it in all the same way. The next point I'd make about this, this data is about the difference between consumer data and healthcare data and a patient data, if you like. And we sometimes lose that. And the amount of consumer data that is out there that is relevant to healthcare and the distinction between the generation's attitude to that needs to be understood in this concept. Even when you look at patients, it's worth remembering that patients' attitudes change. So those with very rare diseases absolutely need to share their data because there's so few of them, in contrast to much more common types of uh, conditions. And then a few other points. So when it's about quality of data, and we, we dismiss this, I think, or do not pay it enough attention. So the quality of data that exists in clinical environments, there is not enough incentive for hospitals, for instance, to actually make sure that all the data fields are populated, that the tests can be uh, really relied on and accurate. And for industry wanting access for things like AI, the quality of the data is uh, very important. The next thing I just touch on is data bias and the need to be cognizant of this. And for AI, if we're not careful and we don't properly look at this whole subject, um, then there are potential problems. Um, another couple of perhaps some of the most important points for me. Technology, um, there are 
a number of people on this panel who are professors and eminent people. For society in general, there is a real lack of understanding of healthcare conditions, uh, treatments, uh, and, and sometimes we don't want to know, but there are lots of times when we do need to know. And so explaining to patients the technologies uh, and to citizens, having transparency, clear communication of security, ethics, use and feedback of results are all critical, I think, for AI to uh, realize its full potential. So this education and skills leads into leaving no one behind. If we're not careful, this digital divide will lead to greater exclusion rather than actually increasing access to health services for society in general. So the final point I'd like to make is just to pose a question, which is one of the things we've been working on is a quid pro quo. So what, are, what is the quid pro quo for allowing access to data? And, and I'll happily pick that up perhaps in, in, the, in the panel. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very inspiring uh, uh, intervention. Uh, uh, we mentioned uh, during this uh, panel uh, that the knowledge, understanding and uh, uh, literacy related to the healthcare, healthcare data is very important. So I think uh, uh, um, uh, it's one of the key solution for the future. Uh, and we need not only to patients uh, 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 understood uh, uh, with readiness to understand what is going on with their health and uh, uh, what kind of data can be useful for the uh, diagnosis, treatment and, and the future therapy and so on, but also we need to educate uh, the clinicians, uh, uh, all clinicians in all countries of the European Union, because I feel that there is a lack of uh, of understanding of, of new technologies and how we can use and uh, clinicians could use could use it. Uh, uh, it would be very interesting to check if uh, uh, at the curricula uh, uh, or, or at the medical universities we have this kind of uh, of uh, uh, um, uh, aspects of uh, of new uh, healthcare uh, models. And thank you very much uh, uh, for your. Uh, uh, remark about uh, the different uh, classes of data, yes, because we need to understand that they should be uh, treated in, in, in different kinds, uh, in, in different models, uh, uh, in different uh, ways. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, now I, I want to give uh, the uh, screen to the uh, Vida Groznik, uh, 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 from uh, assistant professor from, uh, at, at the University of Primorska, please. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Boni. Um, so good morning, everybody. I'm really honored to be here today with such distinguished panelists. First of all, please let me apologize if my connection drops. I'm currently in Dubai at Expo and sometimes the connection can fail if people are <laughs> connecting too much. Uh, so for be more sure I will uh, share my slide and turn off my camera. I hope you don't mind so that um, the connection stays here. Um, so um, my name is Vida Groznik. Um, I am a CEO of a startup company, News Diagnostics. I'm also an pro assistant professor at the University of Primorska and a researcher at the University of Ljubljana. And today I will briefly introduce one of the medical domains where we use AI to tackle the healthcare challenges. And that is diagnosing dementia as early as possible. So when we think of dementia, um, we are imagining elderly people who are forgetting things and who are not able to perform the activities of the daily living by themselves. But what we usually don't ask ourselves is how long this process of deterioration has been going on and when did the person start showing the first signs of dementia. The thing is that the cognitive impairment can, that can lead to dementia can start years before a person develops clinical signs of the dementia. Um, and this can actually start after uh, 40 years of age, but more often after 50. 
So what we want is to be able to detect cognitive impairment before the onset of dementia, as at that stage, with certain lifestyle adjustments and also treatments, we can change the course of the disease. So first, why dementia and why now? So there were over 50 million people worldwide living with dementia in 2020. This number will almost double every 20 years, reaching 82 million in 2030 and 152 million in 2050. And much of the increase will be in the developing countries. Um, so now already 60% of people with dementia live in low and middle income countries, but by 2050, this will rise to 71%. And the fastest growth in the elderly population is taking place in China, India, uh, and their South Asian and Western Pacific neighbors. So how dementia is diagnosed now? So first you need to go to your GP who um, you talk to and tell them your problems. And based on your clinical science and observation, um, he assesses whether to refer you to a neurologist or not. If you got a referral, you wait a few months, up to half a year, one year, depends on the country, and the neurologist then directs you to various imaging and laboratory tests and also psychological evaluation. And based on all of the results, he gives a diagnosis and if needed, prescribes the treatment. So how AI can actually help? So how can we use AI to speed up the previous steps and detect the clinical impairment before it develops into dementia? And for this task, we're using eye tracking technology uh, that records eye movements of a patient when he's looking at the computer screen and solving different neuropsychological tests. And for this purpose, we have built our own digitalized test battery that incorporates uh, neurological and psychological domain knowledge, because this is really an important part. And we record the patient's eye movements when he's solving the test and send the data to our AI module. The module then processes the data and in a matter of seconds gives the result, which is a probability that a person is showing signs of mild cognitive impairment. So we are trying to catch the disease. So the, the, um, the yeah, the impairment before it actually develops into dementia. Um, so MCI is not the only domain where we use this approach. We're currently involved in a Marista Doska Kuri project where we use this approach to detect signs of cognitive and motor impairment in preterm children and following them up, uh, how they're progressing, how uh, the treatment is going on. We're also using it for other neurological diseases such as Parkinson's disease and autism spectrum disorder. Uh, and now what are the challenges when you're building such a tool? Of course, first of all, it's GDPR, uh, which um, limits us on using the data of our patients. And another one, which uh, I think wasn't mentioned before is MDR. So this is medical devices regulative. Um, and this regulative has been on the market since uh, May this year. And it's kind of a restrictive in a form of device classification. So such a tool that I just um, explained to you is actually a class uh, 2B device, not class one as it was before. Uh, it also has to be CE certified by a respective authority. We need to perform, of course, clinical trials, first for data collection, normally, and then also to be able to show that this device is not harmful for people using it. Then we have problems and challenges with data collection and sharing because, of course, it's not easy to get uh, health records for a company like a, a SME. Um, and the data sharing, of course, is problematic. Then we also need to ask ourselves whether how much data we need. So this is quantity versus quality in the data. When we're building this kind of device, we of course want to have a lot of data, but if the data is not good, it's not qualitative, then it's better to maybe have a bit less of the data, but them to be more and more qualitative. And the end point of all these challenges is that the development of this kind of uh, device is quite costly especially the part which uh, is under MDR uh, and of course clinical trials. 
So this is um, all from me. I would just like to thank you for your attention. And so AI can definitely can definitely help us tackling healthcare challenges. But so the technology is ready. But the question is, how ready are we? And how ready is the healthcare sector? And how ready is the regulatory? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Vida, for your presentation from Dubai. I think it is uh, it is very useful uh, um, in uh, the intervention done by Axel Voss, member of the European Parliament. It was raised uh, that when we are discussing about uh, GDPR, uh, we need to consider that the most important barrier now is different kind of interpretations of some articles in the uh, different member states uh, in germany as i know in some different lands yes so so this is a real challenge not uh, uh, gdpr per se but uh, how to use gdpr yes and i think that uh, it is also important and uh, uh, you have mentioned uh, uh, the medical device uh, device regulation i think it is crucial yes because uh, uh, um, in, in my mind, in my opinion, uh, those regulations were established uh, uh, just before in the era of artificial intelligence. So they are adjusted uh, uh, to the completely different environment. Yes? And if we want to combine artificial intelligence, uh, uh, medical devices, uh, and also use data, so we need to, uh, to look at, at those three aspects of regulation uh, how to make it uh, much more uh, uh, not flexible but uh, but uh, useful for the purpose as uh, a purpose is the health of the uh, society thank you very much and last but not least uh, dr jose fernandez please uh, the screen is yours thank you thank you very much if if you could please uh, put my slides uh, uh, SME. Um, yes uh, Thank you very much. I, you know, the, 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 being the last one to talk, uh, I, you know, there will be lots of things which have been uh, mentioned before, but it's always good to reiterate uh, part of this message. And, uh, you know, I'm thrilled, uh, I'm privileged to be uh, the Chief Data Officer of an organization like Institut Curie. And in the next slide, please. Institut Curie is an organization with uh, a hospital group dedicated to cancer and also a um, center of research uh, focused on on research, fundamental research. When we look into medicine, uh, we can see that over the last 2000 years, it has changed dramatically. Healthcare is one of the major success stories of our times, you know, moving from horoscopes and reading the entrails to, to predict the outcomes of diseases to genomics and precision medicine, and even uh, moving uh, towards uh, intersection where we are uh, trying to detect the moment where uh, cellular lineages uh, detach themselves from the normal trajectory, and we can this we can detect the uh, onset of disease before even the first signs of disease appear, as as Vida just uh, just mentioned. Next slide, please. I will focus on cancer because it is what we do at Institut Curie, and uh, uh, but obviously we have seen a number of uh, conditions and having a different different diseases. But when we look into into cancer, for example, we have uh, over. Uh, you know, over a thousand patients are diagnosed with cancer every day in France. We have uh, uh, over 8 million people are killed by the disease uh, a year uh, worldwide. It is, a, it is, it is a, a serious problem. And that's, uh, you know, we are working in a very fast moving field. Next slide, please. And as it was mentioned before, you know, we're moving in a space where uh, what it was, uh, uh, developed uh, a year ago, you know, we are living in these COVID days where, you know, a brand new virus detected, new vaccines, new treatments, you know, a year, a year it sounds, looks like an eternity, you know, in this fast moving field, uh, developments from a year ago, today are considered uh, all news. Uh, uh, we are working in this medical space where medical knowledge doubled every 50 years. Today, at the current pace every three days, that means that no clinician can keep with this. And that's why we need to augment our clinicians. And that's why we need to work uh, with systems which enable them to handle this uh, tsunami of information. Even when we talk about cancer, cancer is a complex disease. It is more than 200 different uh, 
types of tumors, and we are talking about millions of specific uh, mutations. So uh, a very, very uh, complex uh, uh, space where if we look into the next slide, uh, as, as, uh, as uh, medical sciences has improved, you know, uh, life expectancy around the world is growing. Uh, longevity increases, um, uh, yeah, please, uh, increases uh, uh, the cost. Now is the, pre the pre previous slide, please. Uh, the challenges over the next, yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, the spending in our current health care systems cannot keep up. Uh, we, it was mentioned before, new treatments are very expensive. Uh, tailored uh, treatments uh, are, are increasing the, the, the costs uh, in our uh, healthcare systems. And uh, we need uh, uh, support structural and transformational change so that our healthcare systems, as they are struggling today, can become uh, sustainable. One of the obvious cases in, the, in, in, in cancer, it is uh, cancer is a genomic disease. Most cancers have a collection of uh, mutated uh, oncogenes, tumor suppressors, which work together. And we need to, to keep track, you know, so that uh, there is this, uh, you know, the, 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 we can track the moment where the genesis and progression of this disease appears. In the next slide, but today in this 21st century, we can see how uh, there is a, a uh, three em emerging uh, technological pillars. Uh, we can see that biology is becoming more and more molecular. Medicine is more and more digital. DNA sequencing, personal computers, internet, all these is uh, all these developments are ushering us into this uh, big data era data, more data, but something which uh, often is, is forgotten, and we have, we can, we have, even throughout uh, the talks today, uh, we talk, we tend to focus on, on volumes, on amount of data, big data, but we tend to, we tend to forget quality, and this is critical. When we are training these systems, we need, we, we would rely on data uh, of quality, otherwise our models will be, uh, biased, as it was mentioned, or, or will be not uh, sustainable. But we have to look into the overlaps into the different disciplines, and that's why we work with multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary teams and develop the elements which enable us to glue all this biomedical research together. Uh, we have to use computer science, statistical methodologies, and uh, so that we can make sense of these uh, vast amounts of, of data. But what do we mean by AI in healthcare? We've, we, there were some, we've seen some examples, low hanging fruit where routine and repetitive tasks can be automated. And we've seen some examples of radiology and pathology. The next step is uh, when we move into integrating these systems and into our homes and to moving away from the hospital base to a home based uh, care. And here we have uh, uh, connectivity, we have uh, deep learning, natural language processing approaches. And the final phase is where we move into uh, clinical decision support uh, tools and we are uh, carry on uh, augmenting our clinicians to a new, to a, to a different level. Next slide, please. But we are facing as a society a multifaceted complex challenge. I mentioned again, I rated it focus on cancer, and that's what you see in some of the clear examples here. But you know, we have uh, infectious diseases, uh, there is uh, global uh, heating and climate change, uh, the aging populations, inequality access, inequality in the access to healthcare services, and something which you shouldn't forget is also the shortage of health uh, professionals. All these, you know, next slide, I mentioned cancer, but there are lots of diseases and there are, there are many more questions than, uh, than answers and treatments. So uh, the next slide, in a nutshell, when it comes to focus on the subject of today's uh, discussion, SMEs and AI, uh, AI healthcare, what I see is that this digital revolution offers uh, promising uh, sources of technological innovation. And what we have, uh, we have from the implementation of federated ecosystems, and here is a space where SMEs can work. We have uh, interoperability as a critical space, making data is as fair, and means findable, accessible, interoperable, interoperable and reusable as possible. Integration of uh, molecular and clinical data, 
developing of, of standards and harmonized uh, data sets. We've been seeing a number of initiatives, European Cancer uh, Patient Digital Center, that requires uh, practice harmonization and data standards. And we shouldn't forget that we need to have all this information in a store and share uh, in a securely in a securely way. Uh, next slide, just to finish, you know we have seen the current uh, days with the pandemic how uh, the sharing of data has become critical to address big uh, uh, health issues, and uh, we can also see how big data is positively uh, driving advances in healthcare. And with this, the next slide says to thank you and uh, put in some of the words of Marie Curie, founder of GCG Curie, uh, without a critical mind, what would we be? And with this, uh, I pass it uh, to you, Michal. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's a pleasure because uh, I'm from Poland, as uh, also Piotr Szymański, so we have the special attention to Maria Curie Skłodowska. Uh, and on the other hand, thank you very much uh, 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 for uh, your presentation and uh, and uh, uh, putting uh, some questions related to the advantages, uh, because it's also important to understand how significant the development of artificial intelligence in healthcare area could be in relation to the development of some diseases. Yes, yeah? because uh, I think it's. Uh, it's, it's crucial and you have also uh, at the end uh, mentioned the question of infrastructure. Uh, I think it is, it is very, very important because uh, uh, we need interoperability and we need interoperability uh, at the semantic level uh, uh, because it's, uh, the purpose is to, uh, uh, to, 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 to make the solution in which all uh, 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 digital systems can uh, uh, talk uh, them, uh, uh, between themselves, yes, and, and I think it's, it's crucial, and on the other hand, I think that uh, uh, when we are discussing about, uh, about uh, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, uh, data collections, uh, and uh, sending all those data, we need to consider how uh, fast we can build in the European Union uh, 5G infrastructure, yes, because uh, this is uh, this is uh, the, the proper uh, uh, quality of, of network. Uh, uh, this 5G uh, network can can bring to to us. Uh, we have one question related to uh, related to uh, uh, using GDPR. If you can look, uh, I'm talking to all panelists. Uh, uh, how is Article 22 in GDPR handled in healthcare, uh, uh, artificial intelligence, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, other special security standards? And also, Rudolf Rabel, uh, question to to uh, Mr. Voss, uh, uh, referring to paragraph 117 to draft report. Uh, 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 Axel, could you could you look at this? If, if not, because... Sorry. Uh, yes. yes, I, I uh, might yeah, have a look, but yes. let me first clear what is 117. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, I yeah, have yeah, to sure. look it up and then I can... Could you, yeah. Mr. Mr. Rebel, could you write it in, in, in the, in the Q&A uh, chat? Okay. Be, 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 I, I'm not sure if we have time to, uh, to wait. I'm very sorry. Uh, but on the other hand, as I... Uh, uh, as I properly understand, uh, 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 when we are discussing about the, the artificial intelligence regulation, ex ante uh, uh, impact assessment is crucial. Yes, when we are discussing about uh, uh, those artificial intelligence systems, uh, uh, high risk, uh, um, and I think this is the achievement in our European. Uh, uh, understanding of the artificial intelligence development. We have uh, four minutes, so uh, uh, if uh, you, Axel, want to say something, and after that I will summarize. Axel, please. So 117 is about the ex ante um, risk self-assessment and with a CE marking um, or data protection impact assessment. 
So um, this is also combined surveillance based on clear rules and standards. So this is these 117. And I think um, because um, we have a situation in the competition and the, the question of speed, I, I, we are thinking about every issue what can um, catch up with the speed. So these um, CE marking and, and uh, the robust uh, governance also for AI um, is, is something what we should do um, from the beginning and integrate it in the whole process so that we are not ending up at the situation that someone is developing something and then at the end we have all the um, uh, yeah, governance authorities and saying, oh, no, 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 this is not what I would like to have. So that's why um, I think it, it needs to be more integrated. And um, so that we can uh, think from the beginning in one process and that we are getting more and more kind of a more service orientated a governance structure and not a kind of the end of everything in, in evaluating. So that's a kind of onboard um, uh, situation and, and uh, try to speed up the whole process. So that's um, what I think it's necessary as far as I understand at uh, this 117 and this getting just the overview of it. But um, so, but this is the idea behind that we have a um, more integrated process instead of um, having every uh, single step on its own and, and so on. And this is, I, I would say, this is what we need to build these business models for AI developers and, um, and, and make this more reliable at the end. And, um, not prolonging and delaying the whole process. Thank you very much, Axel. And uh, uh, we, we unfortunately, we have to, to finish our fantastic panel and debate. And if I can say, uh, I want to present some recommendations uh, coming from our discussion. Uh, uh, in the order which is, uh, which is not so good properly, not so proper, uh, uh, but, uh, but, but I think related to our de debate. Uh, firstly, uh, we need to, if we want to develop artificial intelligence in healthcare area in the European Union, we need to take care about the development of, of the proper infrastructure. Interoperability is crucial. Interoperability at the semantic level, uh, it requires to develop 5G networks. Secondly, uh, as it was raised at the beginning of our discussion, this is the opportunity using artificial intelligence in healthcare area. This is the opportunity to humanize health, uh, healthcare area uh, because uh, there will be probably new relations between patients and, uh, and clinicians. So it's, it's very, very important. And on the other hand, uh, uh, humanize uh, uh, healthcare uh, uh, is related with the personalization of uh, healthcare area, which is important and is possible only due to uh, using uh, algorithms, uh, data uh, uh, analytics and artificial intelligence. Thirdly, uh, it was clear for all of us during the discussion how important the data is uh, uh, because it's crucial and we need to discuss about accessibility, uh, about quality of data, uh, uh, also, uh, as I have mentioned earlier, interoperability and uh, what is important, uh, the discussion about models of sharing the data, as it was suggested in the Data Governance Act, uh, but it should be developed in Data Act, which will be presented by the Commission in the next year, uh, it is crucial. And fourthly, uh, uh, we need to ensure, as it was raised by uh, one of the panelists, panelists uh, 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 the, uh, to, to, to give, to, to create the model in which uh, uh, patients could control their own data. Yes, it will build the trust. Fifthly, uh, uh, we need to take care about the excellence 
of all the uh, processes uh, um, uh, of using of artificial intelligence. So we need evaluation, we need effectiveness. And uh, as it was uh, uh, added uh, in the chat by Piotr Szymański, uh, uh, we, we need to uh, work on uh, 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 clinical evidence and standards uh, 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 thinking about artificial intelligence regulation, but also within the framework of uh, medical uh, um, devices uh, regulation. Uh, and uh, sixthly, uh, uh, we need to uh, have the holistic view on all of those issues and build the complex environment. So at the same time, we need when we want to take all advantages related to artificial intelligence in healthcare, uh, we need to, to discuss at the same time uh, 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 and use uh, some kind of uh, transdisciplinary uh, view uh, uh, related to data act, uh, related to uh, artificial intelligence regulation, uh, related to devices and so on and so on. So holistic view is needed uh, and at that time, I think we can achieve uh, uh, the uh, competitive advantages in the European Union, developing using of artificial intelligence in healthcare. But on the other hand, uh, uh, we can work uh, in uh, the purpose of uh, uh, making uh, uh, healthcare uh, much more effective and uh, uh, personalized and adjusted to citizens' uh, patients' needs. So uh, this is uh, the end of our meeting. Thank you very much also uh, for the final debate of the chat uh, uh, between Piotr Szymański and uh, uh, Jose Fernandez. Uh, unfortunately, we need to finish, but I hope that SME Europe will be ready uh, to organize uh, um, uh, with uh, Axel Foss uh, uh, as a host the next uh, the next stage of our discussion, I think, because uh, uh, as we can see, it is very needed and uh, there are many, many areas uh, to exchange, uh, uh, to exchange views. Thank you very much and have a nice day.